The title I chose for my talk is Why Chromosomes in Chimps and Humans Are Horrendously Different. These are not my words. They actually come from a man named David Page, who is probably the world authority on, human, on the human Y chromosome. He is quoted in a Nature News article called The Fickle Y Chromosome, Chimp Genome Reveals Rapid Rate of Change, which you can find on the internet for free. He says that the common chimp and human Y chromosome are, quote, horrendously different, end quote, from each other. Now, horrendously different is not usually the kind of quote you would find in a scholarly article. His quote was referring to a paper in Nature by Jennifer F. Hughes et al., and the last author was David Page himself, in 2010, entitled, Chimpanzee and Human chromos uh, Y Chromosomes Are Remarkably Divergent in Structure and Gene Content, which you can also get on the internet, either from Nature itself um, or from MIT. Remarkably divergent is somewhat more professional than horrendously different. So why the use of the word horrendously? Well, let's look at the story carefully. We will cover evolutionary expectations for the Y chromosome, which are that humans and chimps should have a very similar Y chromosome. We will also cover the data that shows the two species Y chromosomes to be, quote, horrendously different, end quote. The fact that intrahuman variation is less than expected. The failure of evolution to predict these facts. And finally, research opportunities for creation science. First, we will discuss evolutionary expectations for the Y chromosome. The rest of the genome is often said to be 99% similar, as we will see particularly in a talk by Tim Standish uh, in a couple of days when I give this uh, finally. Uh, that is a st selected statistic, and the true number is considerably less than 99%, and depending on how you count dissimilarities, could be as low as 70%. But certainly, if you take the best aligned segments, the similarities can be quite striking, sometimes exceeding 99%. So the naive expectation would be that the uh, chimp and y human Y chromosomes should be quite similar. Many reptiles are sexed by heat. That is, in the case of turtles, the cooler ones are males and the hotter ones are females. In the tuatara, it is the reverse. The hotter ones are males and the cooler ones are the females. For alligators, the cooler ones and the hotter ones are female, and the ones in the middle are male. Thus, for many reptiles, the chromosomes do not determine sex. Since mammals are supposedly uh, descended from reptiles, and from the standard scientific view perspective, it is not supposedly, but as sure as the sun rises in the east. That means that the Y chromosome and the X chromosome originally had to come from a single chromosome. And since the Y is smaller, it is commonly thought of as, in an important sense, a degenerative X chromosome. Since the Y chromosome cannot cross over during reproduction, except for very small parts uh, of the ends, with any other chromosome, there is no way of correcting it. That means the bad genes or gene deletions can hitchhike on a chromosome that is selected because it has particularly good genes somewhere else. Thus, if we assume common ancestry, the Y chromosome has grown smaller with time. How much smaller? This slide shows a Y chromosome false colored blue next to an X chromosome false colored pink. You can see how much smaller the Y chromosome is. Now these are not ideas that I made up. They can be found in the standard peer reviewed literature. And uh, for example, in Science News of about this time, 
one can find the following written. The Y chromosome has long been thought of as a stagnant part of the genome where genes are slowly decaying in males of all species. For almost a century, researchers have thought that the Y chromosome with far fewer genes than the X was decaying. Both sex chromosomes evolved from an ordinary pair of chromosomes more than 200 million years ago. But since the Y has steadily lost genes, as well as its ability to recombine and swap genes with the X chromosome, this suggests that the Y has long been an isolated chromosome with little left to lose, just a couple hundred genes at most, whose job is to produce sperm and determine the sex of offspring. As a result, researchers predicted that the Y chromosome should be nearly identical in humans and chimpanzees, like the rest of the genome. In an article in Forbes magazine, which is available on the internet, again for free, um, it's a science article and it quotes David Page, uh, we get an idea of how much degeneration the human Y chromosome is believed to have undergone. It says he, referring to David Page, found that the human Y chromosome contains only 19 of the 600 genes it once shared with the X chromosome. So we're talking about a very small set of genes. Um, <clears throat> Going back to Nature News, we find the quote that we began with. The entire paragraph reads, the common chimp, pan troglodytes, and human Y chromosomes are, quote, horrendously different from each other, end quote, says David Page of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who led the work. It looks like there's been a dramatic renovation or reinvention of the Y chromosome in the chimpanzee and human lineages. We will take a look at the Nature article in more detail. Our laboratories previously demonstrated that the human male-specific Y chromosome material, which is what euchromatin means, is largely comprised of two sequence classes, ampliconic and X-degenerate, which we will define shortly. We find that the same two sequence classes dominate the chimpanzee MSY U chromatin, figure 1A and B, and thus the same was likely true in the common ancestor. The authors here are trying to emphasize that there are some similarities between human and chimp Y chromosomes. They are now going to define ampliconic and X-degenerate more completely. The ampliconic segments are composed of large, nearly identical repeat units, most often arrayed as palindromes, or stretches of DNA which read the same both ways. And they harbor multi-copy gene families expressed predominantly or exclusively in the testis. By contrast, the X Degenerate segments are dotted with single copy stretches of DNA that can be aligned with X-linked genes. These single copy MSY genes, most of which are expressed all over the genome, are surviving relic relics of ancient non-sex chromosomes from which the X and Y chromosome evolved. Together, the ampliconic and X-degenerate sequence comprise the bulk of the male-specific Y chromosome material in both chimpanzee and human. A third sequence class in the human MSY euchromatin, the X transpose sequence, has no counterpart in the chimpanzee MSY. The presence of these sequences in the human MSY is the result of an X to Y transposition that occurred in the human lineage after its divergence from the chimpanzee lineage. How do they know this? How do they know that this is a result of an X to Y transposition? Well, because it has to be. Otherwise, there would have to be brand new material in the Y chromosome and it would have 
not have had time to evolve that way. So it must have come from the X. Given that uh, primate sex chromosomes are hundreds of millions year of years old, theories of decelerating decay would predict that the chimpanzee and human MSY should have changed little since the separation of these two lineages just six million years ago. To test this prediction, we aligned and compared the nucleotide sequences of the chimpanzee and human male-specific Ys, supplementary file three. As expected, we found that the degree of similarity between comparable or alignable chimpanzee and human MSY sequences, about 98.3% nucleotide identity, differs only modestly from that reported when comparing the rest of the chimpanzee and uh, human genomes, which is 98.8% if you line them right. Note that in many of the genes themselves, chimps and humans are almost identical. They go on to say, surprisingly, however, over 30% of chimpanzee MSY sequence has no homolog homologous alignable counterpart in the human MSY, and vice versa. Supplementary figure eight in note three. In this respect, the MSY differs radically from the remainder of the genome, where less than 2% of chimpanzee euchromatic sequence lacks a homologous alignable counterpart in humans and vice versa. We conclude that since the separation of the chimpanzee and human lineages, sequence gain and loss have been far more concentrated in the MSY than in the balance of the genome. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over a couple paragraphs. Um, we did discover that within the repeating palindromic regions, Three of nine multi-copy testis-expressed gene families present in humans have been mutationally disabled or are simply absent in the chimpanzee, table one. And they give an example. We confirm the presence of the disabling mutation in the example they give. Um, in five additional chimpanzees and two bonobos, close relatives of the common chimpanzee, data not shown. Oh, it would be nice to see that data. How does the chimpanzee bonobo split compare with the chimpanzee human split? Perhaps it is much, much smaller. Let's see, I think I'm skipping over that, yeah. In aggregate, the consequence of gene loss and, and gain in respectively the chimpanzee and human lineage is that the chimpanzee MSY contains only two-thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human MSY and only half as many protein coding transcription units, table one. In, by contrast, in the remainder of the genome, comparison of chimpanzee draft sequence with human reference sequence suggests that the gene content of the two species differs by less than 1%, reference 15. Indeed, at six million years of separation, the difference in MSY gene content in chimpanzee and human is more comparable to the difference in non-sex chromosomal gene content in chicken and human at 310 million years of separation. That sounds like an exaggeration, but as we will see a little later, it is the sober truth. We have concluded the first comprehensive comparison of Y chromosomes from two species, any two species, providing empirical insight into Y chromosome evolution and a test of decelerating decay theories. These theories elegantly account for the degeneration observed in neo, I think, yeah, that is neo. Neo Y chromosomes, new Y chromosomes recently evolved from autosomes. However, they did not predict and cannot account for the rapid divergence of the older, highly evolved chimpanzee and human MSYs described here. Instead, remodeling and regeneration have dominated chimpanzee and human MSY evolution during the past six million years. What are they saying here? 
Basically, they're saying that decelerating decay theories have failed an important experimental test. They need to be modified severely, if not discarded. Remodeling and regeneration sound suspiciously like redesign. Now, having destroyed the old theory, the articles now feel obliged to enter a hypothesis of their own that is not design. Here's the paragraph where they do this. Frankly, I have a hard time figuring out exactly what the point is. Uh, if you can make sense of it, please let me know. In the future, complete Y chromosome sequences from additional species will shed further light on these hypotheses. And now, two pictures that say it all. First, a general comparison which shows the approximate percentage to be about the same of general types, except for the addition of X transposed areas to the human Y chromosome. And I must add heterochromatin that makes up a good share of the human Y chromosome. Note the tiny areas at the end that can actually cross over with the X chromosome. The male specific Y excludes those areas. Second, a more specific plot. Now this plot is accompanied by a plot of human versus chimpanzee on chromosome 21, which we'll look at first. Note um, that although there are areas that are slightly fainter than others, such as the one to which the red arrow points, and there are dots suggesting repeating segments in both the human and the chimpanzee, Y uh, pardon me, not Y chromosomes, uh, chromosome 21, the major effect is one that shows the human and chimpanzee chromosomes corresponding almost exactly to each other over most of their length. It is certainly believable that the correspondence here approaches 99%. However, when we look at the human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes, they are totally reorganized compared with each other. You'll notice that there are large swaths where there is nothing in the chimpanzee Y chromosome that corresponds to the human chromosome and vice versa. Now, since the article was published, there have been very few additional Y chromosomes done. The same group did a rhesus monkey Y chromosome without giving us a matching plot. And I found a comparison between pig chromosomes and various other chromosomes. The pig chromosome uh, comparisons are interesting in several regards. I've taken the, uh, uh, the drawing and rotated it um, 90 degrees but the points will remain. Um, let's see. The, uh, notice that, the pig, that they have plots of the pig X chromosome, which is somewhat divergent from that of sheep and cows, but almost identical with that of cats, dogs, humans, and chimpanzees implying that pigs are more closely related to cats or dogs or perhaps humans and chimps than to cows and sheep, which of course is not standard evolutionary theory. Notice again that rabbits, rats, and mice are considerably different from the others, leading to an interesting evolutionary tree if one were to take X chromosome uh, instead of physical morphology as a major criterion for relatedness. Notice also that the pig Y chromosome has very little crossover material with any other animal. Going back to the Nature News ar uh, article, even the portions that do line up have undergone erratic relocation. 
In the only other chromosome to have been sequenced to the same degree of completeness in both species, chromosome 21, the authors found much less rearrangement. If you're marching along the human chromosome 21, you might as well be marching along the chimp chromosome 21. It's like an unbroken piece of glass, says Page. But the relationship between the human and chimp Y chromosomes has been blown to pieces. With the graph show, uh, showing the matches between the chromosomes, one can easily see what Page is talking about. Now, one, uh, one expectation of evolutionary theory, given this data, that might explain that much evolution between chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes is that evolution is proceeding at a very rapid rate in Y chromosomes, and therefore that human Y chromosomes are quite divergent from each other, much more than other chromosomes. That explanation is incorrect, that expectation. We will be looking at an article in PLOS Genetics, which is again available online. Under simple neutral models with constant and equal male and female population sizes, diversity is expected to be proportional to the relative number of each chromosome in the population. X diversity is expected to be three quarters of autosomal diversity because there are three X chromosomes for every four autosomes. And both the Y and mitochondrial DNA diversity are expected to be one quarter autosomal diversity. Here, um, I'm going to skip over that. Um, uh, in fact, I'm going to skip over that too. Um, and I'm going to go straight to. Uh, didn't allow it. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go straight to Figure One. If you read this, it's not entirely easy to figure out. Uh, it can be, but uh, the explanation was, was of some difficulty, but I think you can see it more easily on the figure. This is figure one, and you will notice that an X chromosome diversity almost exactly three quarters of that of autosomes in Europeans, and larger than that, but close to the diversity that is expected because of uh, autosomes in the African population that was studied. Notice that the mitochondrial numbers again hover around 25%. However, both the African and European Y chromosome divergence is much, much less than the predicted one quarter of the autosomal divergence. Rather than being more variable than the rest of the genome, it is less variable the precise opposite of what one would need to explain the difference between human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes by unguided processes. Now, even though they know about the 2010 article in Nature by Hughes et al., because they cite it and draw several conclusions from it, notice that the PLOS article makes no comment whatsoever about the tension between the lower rates of mutation in humans and the higher rate of divergence between chimpanzees and humans. The same is true of Wikipedia. In fact, I would hazard a guess that you have never heard of this problem for a common ancestry of chimpanzees and humans before, unless you've been in this class. Now, creationist articles note two difficulties raised by the Y chromosome. A partial listing follows. I'm sorry, it shouldn't be two. That, that's an error. Uh, a partial listing follows, all of which are available on the internet, although most of them do not specifically note the problem proposed by a rapidly evolving Y chromosome until it gets to humans, and then its sudden marked decrease in speed of evolutionary divergence. That last reference bears some further attention. Note, um, it's by Jeffrey Tompkins. Uh, note that 
uh, chromosome 22 is still the most similar, although the way Tompkins counts it, it the similarity dropped to around 80%. Other chromosomes hovered around 70%, and one can see that the Y chromosome, by the way he counted it, dropped to around 40%. Now, my take on all of this is as follows. From a naturalistic perspective, chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are horrendously different if one is an evolutionist. The difference does not make sense when compared to the slow evolution of human Y chromosomes. Perhaps the difference is designed. But before we go on, let's review what we found so far. We looked at evolutionary expectations for the Y chromosome, which is, that, is where they sh sh should be quite similar in humans and chimpanzees. Uh, we looked at the data that shows that the two species Y chromosomes were horrendously different. We looked at the fact that the human Y chromosome variance is less than expected, in, which does not mesh with the data regarding interspecies vari differences, if one assumes the standard geological time scale. And this leads us to observe that not only did evolution fail to predict the facts, but it fails to account for the facts comfortably now. But this is where the fun part begins. I think there are major research opportunities for creation scientists here. Predictions could be made. First, since bonobos and chimps will have descended from the same male ancestor out of the ark, in all probability, they would be expected to have very much less y a divergence in their Y chromosomes than, say, the changes between chimpanzees and humans. Remember that data that was not reported by Hughes at all? Second, it will be interesting to check the interspecies variation in chimps. Will we find them also to have a low Y chromosome variability as humans have? That would put more strain on the rapid evolution theory. Thirdly, gorillas and chimps could possibly be descended from the same ancestor, as there's some suspicion that they interbreed, and this might create additional difficulties for natural explanations for the chimp-human difference, if the chimp-gorilla difference is negligible. And finally, it would be interesting to check on horses, zebras, and donkeys, or perhaps wolves, coyotes, and dingoes. African honey dogs, domestic dogs, various foxes. We might be able to say definitively whether there was one wolf ancestor who was responsible for coyotes and foxes, or perhaps one wolf and, fox an uh, and one fox ancestor, or perhaps one wolf, one coyote, and one fox ancestor. I would suspect the former in fact, this approach has the potential to be able to say just what the biblical kinds were, at least with reference to animals that came out of the ark. One particularly nice feature of this research is that whoever undertook it would not have hundreds of, uh, excuse me, would not have hundreds of evolutionary molecular biology labs breathing down his or her neck one would have pretty much the field to oneself. The only drawback would be that it might be difficult to get the research published, but with some care, it is still possible that it could be done. And if good science is that which stimulates research, this makes creationism good science. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <coughs> Who is this presentation for? This is for science teachers primarily, but also uh, theology teachers are going to be listening in. Uh, yes, a comment back. Do you want comments on the presentation or comments on the content? Both. 
I would like to make a suggestion right at the end where you start my take. Uh -huh. You have a slide that has five points on it. I would take the first four of those five points and put them at the beginning with a stronger introduction of why you're doing this so that we know what's going on a little bit. Here's where I'm going, you would be saying. Here are these four points. Then do your presentation and then repeat those four points at the end. Because it took me a little bit at the beginning to try to figure out Exactly why are you giving this presentation to theologians, to teachers, to... So I, I just would strengthen the introduction. I'll see what I can do. I actually have that identical slide at probably about two slides in or four or three slides in. So, uh, but okay. apparently it went by too fast. Well, you have such a mis mixed bag with these people, and I've presented at these kinds of places before, and y you have some people that are going to understand every single word that you're saying, and some that aren't going to understand quite a few. So, But I think that I would not be, I would not assume that they don't get it. I think I would rather assume that they do understand some of those words that you um, kind of glazed over. Because otherwise, it sounds like you're being patronizing. OK. Uh, that, that's interesting. I, I ran it through my daughter, who is not a molecular biologist. And uh, she found the words confusing and wanted me to explain them a little bit. So that, uh, pardon? That would help. That would help. Uh, so uh, if, if apparently, if you use the word and explain it, that would be one thing. But to substitute your explanation as you glaze over the word, I I I didn't think was effective. Okay. Well, we'll see. If your opinion is common, I will have to change the way I present it. Uh, we'll get a comment here in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, can you pass no, the mic now? Thanks. You wanted to comment. No, I, I was agreeing with Dr. Oliver. OK. So it would be better to say the word and then explain it afterwards. Because my daughter thought that was more patronizing, but <laughs> <laughs> can't win them all. But uh, anyway. I felt that uh, several times in the grass, just the grass. Uh, that what? I'd take time in, in the graphs. I'd take time to just explain the ordinate and the abscissa so they know really. I mean, uh, you fly these graphs and you, you have to, hey, which is which and so on. What does this thing really mean? I'd spend just a little more time introducing those graphs. OK. Maybe there are two things going on. One is the scientist that you're quoting and that you know. And that discussion on evolution or creation based upon the intricate science that you both know. And the second thing that's going on is to present that those differences in such a way that it's comprehensible to the audience, the uh, teachers and, and, and the clergy. I, I think there's two conversations that are, are blended and, and we're lacking the clarity for the audience that you're intending. Does that make sense? I, 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 I'm conscious of both of those, and it's uh, and it, it's it's a neat trick to talk to one without having the other one feeling left out, either because I'm patronizing them or because I'm uh, talking over their heads. Then, then per, for me, it would help, and I'm not a scientist. That's okay. And, and you're I, part I know, of the audience, then. <laughs> I, 
taught history, and I found ways to get into the intricacies of that for, for students. But I'm not a scientist on this, but if, if you could have the maybe a slide showing what we're doing, and then what what the Y and the X chromosome, and particularly the Y, you're talking about the Y, and what it does and what it doesn't do relative to humans and to chimpanzees, and, and or the or the connections and the links. I, I don't know. It, ju yeah. it, it, it just needs a little more specificity, clarity, structure, maybe that's the word, for me. And this is not easy. So uh, are, are you, among other things, saying that the graphs need more comment as yeah, well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and I would make, I would make them simpler. <coughs> Well, the graphs I'm getting from the published data, so I can't really make them Yeah, simpler. you can't do that, right. But I can try to explain them. Yeah, right. Because the graphs give a visual uh, explanation to the, to, the, um, to the language. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as I said, I am not making this up. These are not my graphs. Oh, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Uh, yes. Personally, as a teacher, I don't think you need to worry about patronizing. You're there to get information across to the most, to the largest audience that you can get across. And science teachers don't see this every day either. So to me, as you're presenting, like autosomes, I used to call them body chromosomes, so that my kid would under, kids would understand that this doesn't have anything to do with sex, but it builds, these are the ones that built the body. Yeah. But you use the term autosomes, and the reason I don't think you have to worry about patronizing is that people who know this stuff, it's a reminder. Oh yeah, autosomes, okay, yeah, I remember. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you so want to reach as many people as you can. And being uh, that you're teaching to theology or ministers and stuff, they don't take a lot of science. Yeah. So to me, yeah, patronize them. Autosomes, do this. Six and maybe I should start out by apologizing if somebody feels patronized because... I don't think you need to worry about it. <laughs> just if, just go for if it. They're, yes, just go for it. I mean, if they're that <laughs> sensitive, they need to see a counselor. I mean, for Pete's <laughs> sakes. For Pete's sakes, you know, target your audience. Target the ones that are not up here, either middle or lower. And go for it. Okay. Um, if we have a comment way in the back. Go ahead. And meanwhile, if the introduction were clearer to me as to what this is important about, I would be more comfortable. Of course, I'm not a scientist, but I wasn't sure where you were going because I didn't know what the issue was. In teaching, in teaching, they like you to uh, put your goals up. My goal today is blanc, okay. blanc, 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 and then you go from it there. It, 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 it was there, but obviously it wasn't there well enough because it blew it past several people. It, it didn't yeah. register. Yes. Uh, two things. W would you maybe consider putting up that slide that you're referring to, the slide number two or three? Uh, you mean the, 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 the central slide of the whole thing? Uh, the slide where you're showing where you're going with the presentation. Oh, sure. Uh, let's, okay, first, it's, it's here. Um, and that's the very beginning. 
And um, yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. I will take more time at that uh, because it it's there. It's just like I say, you obviously it's not sinking in, so I need to make it sink in a little better. And then it's down here at the at the end. Uh, let's see, and there it is. It's a, exactly the same slide. Um, we have comment here. This is an illustration of say what you're going to say, say it, say what you've said. Yeah, well, I did, but it, uh, like I say, it didn't. It well, didn't. I, th I, I got the feeling that right at the very beginning when you started out with this, if there had been a little bit more of Paul Geem in it, explaining what's going on. Get away from the slides. You talk like you talk when you're talking in class, and you're explaining stuff to us, and we don't all know what you're talking about. But you can make it clear if you're talking rather than if the articles are talking. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Put yourself in it a little bit more. Um, I was coming back here and then one here. Um, could you put up a slide showing, is, was it chromosome 23 and the uh, yeah. human champ? Sure. And uh, I think that was next to, on the same slide, it was next to a, um, a graph of the Y chromosome. There. Yeah, so, uh, 21. Okay. So <clears throat> my question is, is that when, when one looks at this, the impression that comes across is that humans have the same chromosome as do chimpanzees for chromosome 21. Yeah, I'm, somebody says 99%, I wouldn't argue. Um, and then, by contrast, the Y cr chromosome does Y chromosome is not just completely different material in parts of it, but also completely different organization of the part that is relatively identical. Right, so my, my point is, is that in looking at the slide, one could draw a conclusion that we are descended by chimpanzees as evidence from chromosome 21, but then chromosome Y says we're not. And so it's like there's this data that's pointing in two entirely different directions. Yeah. Well, in that case, and of course, the question is, would be raised, uh, which is the more reliable, chromosome 21 or Y? Uh, what do you mean by that? Because uh, chromosome 21 has much more genetic material. Well, no, actually, you have about the same. Uh, genes? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, genetic material. I'm not talking specifically about the number of enzymes that are coded for. I'm talking about the entire material itself. Including the so-called junk DNA? Including what? The so-called junk DNA. Uh, yes. Isn't the number of base pairs in chromosome 21 a lot more than the Y chromosome? No, actually, they're about the same size. The X chromosome is about the same size as chromosome 2, so it's a big one. The Y chromosome is actually about the size of 21. Interesting. So I mean, if, you, if you pick them out, you have a hard time distinguishing the, between those two. The numbering of chromosomes is according to size. The biggest is number one. And they go down from there. OK. Um, may I offer a suggestion? This is something that has been discovered some time ago by those of us who have tried various means of slide presentations. Uh, it's been concluded that having black lettering on white background is superior to having white lettering on black background. It, it is easier to relate to by people. Is there any way you could color code those to show what is human on the Y, what is a uh, chimpanzee on the Y? That 
might make it a little better. Not yes, even on that one to this show is, the this similarity. This is chimpanzee, and that is human. What what coding would you use? The ch the human is compared directly with the chimpanzee here, and the same over here. I don't know. I just I guess I don't get it because I don't know how well, to read the chart. Well, here this this is every time that a human. Uh, this is lining up the human in this, in this direction, and lining up the chimpanzee in this direction, and every time they match, you put a dot. So, for example, you have a whole bunch of dots going here. If you look here, there is a dot, but it's also a dot here, it's also a dot there. That means that this particular part of the human cr uh, chromosome does match the chimpanzee at the expected spot, oh. but it also see the has. Dot. It also yeah. has a whole bunch of little ones that it matches. Yeah. Now, most of it, it doesn't do that. This is repetitive DNA is what it is. And you get a feeling for how much repetitive DNA there is. It's very hard to see, and I don't know that I can draw that much attention to it. I, when I did it, let's see if I go back here. I did... I did uh, Let's see, I did show there. Uh, that's an area that you see is a little weaker than the rest. And then, I, and then I showed this, which is, and that, which are probably the best lineups. It's really hard to see them. Let's turn off the light and it'll be a little easier maybe. Um, there. <laughs> now, you, now can you see it? Oh. But it's really hard to see. There's a little bit of there's a little bit of repetitive material, but most of it is not. Most of it is not. Most of it lines up very beautifully along that line. Warn your audience. Okay, and there's the you know, and then you look at this and it's totally blown apart. Yeah. Uh, could I suggest? Sure. Could I suggest that you explain the axes as representing the the base sequence of the chromosomes from five prime to three prime um, side, so that we know what's actually meant by the axis? Um, I would have to go back to the article and see if I could dig that out from the text because I don't know that it says which is the five prime and which is the three prime. Well, they must. Uh, the, by convention, unless otherwise indicated, you it's five. always five prime to three prime. So I would assume five primes at the top and three primes at the bottom. What does five no, prime in this mean? case, it would go from zero up. It would, would have to go from here to here in uh, that case, because obviously they match. Yes, but what I mean is your five prime would be at the origin and three prime would be at the far end. Yeah, but these are obviously aligned... If that were the case, then you would have to ha you would have everything flipped, and it would be uh, 90 degrees. If it was, if you started at left and you went to right, and then you started at top and you went to bottom, they should match the other way. Yeah. Bottom left corner is the origin for both. So you're saying that that five prime should be at the bottom of this one, and the three prime at the top. That's correct. Yeah. And you, you may very well be right. I'd have to look at the article to find out for sure. The fact that the, the diagonal line is shifted to the right a little bit means that you've got a few extra bases <coughs> on one of these uh, chromosomes that are not present in the other. Yeah, what it means is that, that at the very end, they don't quite match. And uh, there's a little extra material on the chimpanzee that isn't on the human in this case. Right, and the whole thing and is the just same shifting. thing is true up at the very top. That's right. Um, teleomers, I'm not sure what those are. Most people don't really pay too much attention to them because... That's uh, the five uh, prime end. Yeah. Uh, just wondering about the, the, the sparse uh, spots up there, and especially on the right side. Try Photoshop. Uh, it can do marvels. 
<laughs> well, but then, then I defeat the purpose of saying this is their data. Well, but no, no, just you're, enhancing you're just, the color. Uh, you're just enhancing the contrast yeah. so that it can be seen. Well, then what I'd have to do is let me enhance the contrast so you can see it a little better or something like that because I don't want to pretend that, 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 that the data is... Uh, that the data shows well, more than it does. Well, show it this way and then show the enhanced way. Yeah. And in fact, that, yeah, that's what I could do, just like put a fake magnifying glass in, in, in front of it, and then, and then you can see the little dots a little better. But you can see they're very small. Yes. Now I see them. I didn't see them before. I know. It's real easy to miss them. But you can see they're in this kind of a rectangular grid pattern. Obviously, those are repeating segments that come periodically every so often, and they all match each other. I, I wonder if that's line one or something like that that's interspersed in the genome. Yes? Could you put a diagram of a chimpanzee chromosome at the base of the, the uh, x-axis and then put a diagram of the human chromosome on the y-axis so we see that we're lining up the chromosome? So that we kind of overlay them so that it, uh, we're artificially coloring it for people who aren't as familiar with the... Uh, Dummies like me. Okay, well, we will see what we can do. Uh, that's a lot easier to say than it is to do, but it yes. probably can be done. <laughs> yes? A brief editorial. I don't know if other people will be will see it, but the periods go before the footnote numbers. Consistent should go. Oh, talk to nature about that. Oh, they do it that way. It wasn't you. Okay. <laughs> um, most of the reaction has been dealing with. Uh, formatting and presentation. I'd like to raise uh, a couple issues about content and where we go from here. I'm more interested in where we're going and not where we're at right now. Um, theologically speaking, uh, when you look at this, um, God did it. We're believers in creation. It the question, first question everyone's going to have is, well, how did God do this? <laughs> uh, where do we go from here? You know, did God take DNA from chimpanzee and enhance it? And lo and behold, you have humans. Um, what's the role of God? That's the first question, and theologians will ask that. Second question may be even more significant because we're closer to our age. Um, the implication I saw in some of the uh, slides was that you have an awful lot of uh, DNA changes since Noah's flood. And, you know, you get into the whole issue of how much time we have. Do we use Usher's chronology, 2500 BC, thereabouts for the flood? And then you almost fall into the big conundrum as how much um, evolution, if we want to use that term properly in a technical sense, how much evolution can we have, not just with humans and chimps, but you mentioned dogs and wolves and all these things. So that, that could provide an hour of discussion after your presentation. But that's the part that would really grab not only theologians, but lay people, too. I'd like your reaction on that. Well, I, what I heard you saying was that we raised the question of evolution. We don't really, I don't think, because if we believe that humans and chimps were created separately, however they were created, uh, then taking some material that was fit for a chimp in chromosome 21 and using it for a human in chromosome 21 because they have some of the same basic requirements for bodily function uh, could easily happen 
But what it's suggesting is that some parts of the DNA, and particularly concentrated in the Y chromosome, why, why, I don't know, uh, that, that some of the pieces were completely taken, turned around, shuffled, moved in different places, things put between them, uh, completely reorganized. I would say disorganized, but I, I think that's not fair to the creator. I think reorganized is a better term. Yeah, good. Well, yeah, organized answer. differently. And, 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 and new material was added on either one. And so it's brand new material. And the real question is, how do you evolve that? And if the answer is no, then it raises the question as whether the difference between chimps and humans are a matter of evolution, period. Um, I think you answered my question. And you have the two options. There's no middle of the road. And the one option is when you have a random pattern where um, DNA is totally rearranged, we see the fingerprints of God, to use uh, a gentry term. We see fingerprints of God in various ways in design. Um, we see fingerprints of God, and that's a theological solution, which means that scientifically we cannot prove that. Yeah, right? but there is one other thing, and I think that this is important. It also points to the possibility that, as there was one man that came out of the ark, and we're going to have well, what about Shem, Ham, and Japheth? Well, they all had Noah's DNA. Exactly. Specifically including his Y chromosome DNA. Right. And then with various changes, but you'll notice that the changes aren't that much. It's not, human Y chromosome DNA is not as diverse as autosomal DNA. Good, and that would be the other question they would raise. When were these changes made? And you're now pointing in the direction of creation rather than post-flood. Or, well, actually, we're. Uh, I think... Yeah, the, the, the major the chimp changes. human is creation. Right, creation. But what would be interesting is to ask, well, did a chimp and a gorilla go into the ark? Or <laughs> was it a chimpilla? <laughs> a chimpilla, yeah. and, and if it was a chimpilla, then, then uh, you might expect the chimp and the gorilla Y chromosomes to correlate much better. And this is a testable hypothesis, and it would be fun yeah. to find out. Well... There need to be more studies on Y chromosome. As you point out, there are very limited studies where, where they do the whole shebang. Yeah. And the one thing I would really expect is that chimpanzees and bonobos had a common ancestor at the time of the flood. And so the Y chromosome in chimpanzees and bonobos, which are supposed to be one million years apart, should be pretty close to identical. That'd be interesting. And it would be really interesting to do that stuff. It, in fact, it looks like somebody else did it and they didn't publish it in the paper. <laughs> and they seem to have just assumed that the chimpanzee and bonobo uh, chromo Y chromosomes were pretty similar to each other. I'd like to know how similar. Does it line up as well as the chimpanzee human chromosome 21? If it does, it has interesting implications. Time will, time will tell. Um, but the fun part of it is, if we're doing this stuff, nobody's going, to, nobody's going to scoop you because nobody really is interested in doing this. Either they have other interests or they may be terrified of what they're going to find. Uh, yes, comment here. Uh, do we know uh, which traits are inherited in chromosome 21 and which ones are from the Y chromosome? Uh, kind of. We know what enzymes are there. We still don't understand very much about the role of the DNA that is around those enzymes. Uh, we don't understand very much about what DNA that doesn't code for enzymes does. We understand a little bit about it because some of it codes for RNA. Some of it codes for how it's wrapped around the spools. The, uh, the compacting devices inside of the cell. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of it that... Uh, it, there was a time when we assumed that DNA, 
there was just junk and it didn't really matter. You know, it was just kind of along for the ride. Uh, but we're finding out that there are things that it does and some of those things are turning out to be either, I either necessary or at least important. And to give you an idea of, of how sensitive this whole system is, if you have an extra chromosome 21, so you have three instead of two, all saying exactly the same things, you have Down syndrome. That's right. So uh, it's not like you can just have whatever chromosome you want. It's not like it doesn't matter. In fact, one of the things that's interesting in women who have two X chromosomes, one of the X's is inactivated in each cell because apparently two X chromosomes is too many. You still pass on the X chromosomes to your kids, but the one, uh, and, and it's random. Some, uh, some cells it'll be one, some cells it'll be another. Well, it's not really random. It's random at a certain point. And if you want to get an idea of, of how random patchy it is, calico cats have one X chromosome that has a particular pigmentation thing on it, and another one that has another, and they have these patches all over them where one chromosome or the other is inactivated. That gives you kind of a visual idea of, of how the dosage is so important that it will actually inactivate one chromosome in preference to another over significant patches of the body. And yes, that's right. You see, the males, they have to make do with one chromosome and they can't inactivate it. They're stuck with the one chromosome they got. So you can't do a calico cat in male. And that's why. As you can see, this whole subject can just spread all over the place. So my job is to get it all done in less than 30 minutes and make the main point. <laughs> Maybe you need a series, not just one. Well, they won't give me a series. They've given me 30 minutes and that's it. They have too many other subjects to cover. Who's they? Um, the organizers of the conference. Oh. Uh, they're going to be d doing, you know, uh, uh, geology stuff and they're going to be doing... Uh, 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 biology. Uh, there's another whole sub, uh, another whole talk behind, uh, in front of mine, on uh, on molecular genetics, and there's another one two days later that I referred to, and Tim Stanish on, on uh, chimps and humans and 99 percent and what that means. And so, you know, they are covering pieces of the waterfront. Uh, but there's no way you can do, you can't cover this all in one session. So all you can do really is to just try to, you know, try to pull out the points that I think are salient. I hope that by the end, if I didn't catch you at the beginning, by the end you were following. Well, I kind of knew where you were going anyway. Yeah. But I was thinking as a person sitting there and not having sat in your class for years, it was too much in my face for me to pick up. Okay. Well, I will, I will try to see what I can do to, to, to uh, do more talking on the graphs, um, uh, explaining what they are, um, and then um, I'll do more, uh, I'll do explanations of the words right, right after them instead of, instead of, giving my interpretation, uh, that sounds like the consensus view of how it should be done. And uh, we'll emphasize that, that, uh, that first slide more. Uh, so here's where we're going to be going. And I'll, I'll just, I'll take a few, ex maybe a 
couple minutes extra to make the point of where I'm going. There's no discussion at the end, is there? No discussion at the end? Is there? When you're done, you're done. There's no uh, actually, there may be a discussion. I hope there is. Uh, looking at the schedule, it looks like there should be time for it. And it would just uh, be a matter of, you know, how they choose to take that time. In fact, I think mine is the last of, uh, in, the, in the series, so, I mean, it'll be uh, flow directly into that discussion. The discussion that you had just a minute ago about calico cats is fascinating and explains very quickly about What? Yeah. And people love cats. That is true. That is true. Well, just think, we're related to cats in the X chromosome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so on a on a different topic, um, Dr. Ask, was it last week, ask a question about the orphan genes and whether or orphan genes would indicate that there would need to be all, all sorts of species on the ark, not just kinds. So um, my... Well, one thing to keep in mind is that orphan genes could be lost and so, true, and so you true. could have a, a progenitor that had the orphan genes for that family, and that therefore, uh, and then what happened is that certain of them lost that. And, and I'll give you an example. I'm pretty sure the cheetahs are, are not a brand new species. I'm pretty sure they're just part of the cat family. Uh, but they have lost the ability to retract their claws, which is actually, in their case, an advantage because if they're running fast, they need those claws to be digging in. Uh, uh, and the, it, it gives them, you know, it's like, like wearing cleats. But because they're wearing the cleats all the time, they get worn down and, and the claws aren't as sharp. And I guess the trade-off for not having as sharp claws is that you can catch more antelope in the first place because you can actually outrun them. Um, whereas lions can't do that. If they're going to get an antelope, they have to surprise them. Otherwise, the antelope get away. So, so my point is, is that, um, you know, I think many of us believe that when the, um, with the original creation, like genetics were, per were perfect and unchanging, maybe or probably, uh, but um, that when sin entered <coughs> in, God recognized there was a need for species to protect themselves in, in a, a new world in which there was sin and threat from other species. Uh, and so you could have the thorns, let me say thorns on roses as an example. You could have thorns on roses in one of two ways. You could have it by microevolution, natural selection, in which it's, um, you know... Uh, the thorn is actually a, a leaf, leaf that doesn't that doesn't grow, or a branch that doesn't grow, and you probably have examples of both of them. Right, and so it's less, uh, you know, th those that have more thorn-like leaves are eaten less often than those with, without right. that. Yeah. Right, and so you and could in certain environments that's an advantage. Right. And so they reproduce. Well, just like polar bears. Polar bears can't pigment their, their hair. They pigment their skin. Their skin is black. Mm -hmm. but, they, but the hairs are actually depigmented, that's a disadvantage, unless you're in the snow trying to sneak up on a seal. Right, right. <coughs> so, so that's one possible way. But another possible way is perhaps God looked at the situation with sin and said, you know, there's going to be a lot of species that are going to be eaten to extinction real quick. If unless, I don't do something. Yeah. And so, it, and so he had the proto-thorn stuff just waiting to go, and then... Uh, well, when sin happened, a mutation would suddenly, and there would there it would be, but it was actually prepared for. Or God could speak and and, re the and create it right then. Yeah, exactly. So that the thorns actually didn't weren't 
evolutionary, or, or not all of them anyway, were right. evolutionary degeneration, they're actually God creating new stuff. Correct, hence orphan genes that could have been created. That is possible too. And how would we know? Well, the only ways that we would know would be, one, get a sample from before, which fat chance of that happening. Maybe. Or it would be to do a whole bunch of genomes and do some comparisons and to see, well, does it look like God gave orphan genes to these animals that were otherwise all descended from the same ancestor? So, so then um, if we're open to the idea that perhaps God intervened after sin and created not just thorns but created teeth and claws and things like that to help species survive and not go extinct in a sinful world, uh, then if he could do that then, then conceivably at the ark in which there could have been cat kind, uh, but then God could have said, you know what? You I know, want big cats and I want little cats and I want spotted cats and I want striped cats and I want, yeah. Right, right. And so there could have been a, a miniature creation there that would have created a new world with more species and species with orphan genes. In which created. case, if we do this genetic stuff, we may find out that we get to a point where we can't compress this more than four. Right, right. And once we do that, then suddenly... Uh, but at, the point we're, at that point, we're not quite sure whether these are four that God created from a single kind uh, or whether those four got on the, on the ark. Well, one thing that might give you a clue is if they all have virtually identical uh, Y chromosomes, and we can do this for the females, by the way, in mitochondrial DNA, uh, if, if everything lines up except for the orphan genes, then it is a reasonable hypothesis to say, well, the orphan genes must have been created at that point in only certain varieties of this particular kind. On the other hand, if we find that in, when we do the cats, they actually converge into big cats and little cats, then it's reasonable to say, well, he took a liger, or whatever you want to call it, you know, on the ark, and he took a... <coughs> a generic cat crossbreed that includes leopards, let's say. Maybe there's three. I mean, the thing about research is that you don't know what you're going to find before you start. Uh, there are interesting hypotheses to test, and that's what makes science fun, is to find out you know, which of the guesses is the best one. And that's why I say this, shows that creation science could be easily a science that produces all kinds of research. Doesn't mean that uh, the hypothesis of any one creation scientist is going to come out without any flaws. And that includes mine. But it'd be fun to find out. And who knows, you might be able to, be, to say, well, actually, there were... I don't know, 153 different kinds of mammals that came out of the ark. And you'd be able to say, see, uh, uh, you know, you can fit that into an ark of that size. Or maybe you would be forced to say, well, if God didn't t tinker with the genes, which is always a possibility, um, there are actually 935, and now you have a little more interesting time fitting them into the ark. Uh, well, for mammals alone, and then of course you have to have birds and you have to have reptiles. Most mammals are very small. True, true. If they're all voles, nobody really cares. But if you had, uh, but if you have, uh, let's say, if you have a mammoth, and an elephant, and a mastodon, and a, and a uh, you know, now you're starting to fill, a, fill it up a little bit faster. And it'll be interesting, and we have enough genetic information to be able to say something about mammoths and mastodons. How, you know, how many different kinds of mammals do you have to have to get into the ark? 
And it looks like the Y chromosome might uh, enable you to do this in a way that autosomes can't. And the reason that autosomes can't is because for every male, you're going to have a female. And that means four different autosomes, which if God deliberately designed it this way, and Ellen White seems to seem to suggest we, that it was done that way, that God actually went out and selected the animals he wanted in, probably partly for their diversity. Um, and then he, you know, he puts them all into the ark, and then he allows them to come out. And there's a male and a female, but you got four different varieties. Uh, and when you start seeing, you know, four different varieties, you can say that these were descended and they didn't need any special help from God afterwards other than the usual uh, course of nature. So it would be, it'd be an interesting test of, of, of hypotheses as to what are the original uh, kinds. But what I'm hoping is it's that some people who are, have the genetic uh, you know, capabilities get excited about this and say, oh, I'd like to try doing some research like that. Would we have to sequence entire Y chromosomes? If we're going to get those nice plots, we do. But if we want to get the answer, could there be a cheaper way of doing it? Like uh, markers? You know, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Remember back when they were saying it's a 99% similar? Well, you know what they did. They threw away all of the diversity. They just found the, oh, this enzyme matches that enzyme, and yeah, that's 99.3, and this one is 98.7, and this one is 99.2, and, you know, and they, they, add up all the numbers and divide by the, the remainder and they got, uh, was it 98.7 or something like that for the autosomes and they were getting 98.2 or something like that for the Y chromosome. Well, obviously the Y chromosome is nowhere near 99% identical. There's 30% that doesn't match anywhere. That means that the maximum mathematical match is 70%. But you never hear that in the in the in the uh, in the New York Times, right? Can you explain the little X's on the on the? Oh, lint? those are the palindromes. They read the same forward and backward, and so they match this way, hmm. and they also match that way because. It goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, K, I, uh, H, and back down again. So, uh, so they actually match each other as well. And those, that's what those X's are. Those are the palindromes. They read the same forwards and backwards, and so they match double. Can you, can you put that in your, in your presentation? It depends on whether I have enough time. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, there is so much that's fun. We, we, we have a lot more time here to discuss it, but, but I have, you know, I, I really have to shoot for about 25 minutes um, because what will happen is that it expands as you give it. Anyway, I'll, I'll let you guys know uh, uh, by email. Uh, two weeks from today, I will be here, so we will have class then. And maybe we'll have class next week if I uh, can talk somebody who's not going there into doing it.